Hi, everyone. My name is Noah Newman. I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator at Kokoraz headquarters in Colorado. And our guest presenter today is Kokoraz project manager and also state coordinator for Illinois, Steve Hilberg. Uh, Steve spent his career before, well, and a little bit during being the state coordinator for, for Illinois uh, at the Midwest Regional Climate Center. He was the director at, when he retired in 2011. And at, through, through his career, he actually is the co-developer of a, of a really interesting product called Aussie, which is an acronym for the Accumulated Winter Season Severity Index. And so he is an expert in winter precipitation measurements. He is also a, a big part of the quality control of our data here at Kokoraz. So sometimes if you get an email, maybe asking about your data, it might have come from Steve. So without further ado, I will let Steve share his screen and begin the presentation today. Alrighty. All right. It's looking good, Steve. All right, good. I will get here. Let me just pull it up on my screen. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> well, everyone, uh, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to join us here to learn something about winter precipitation measurements. Uh, if you're here and interested, it means that uh, you are interested in measuring winter precipitation measurements or actually finding out if it's your cup of tea. Um, we welcome especially new observers who haven't been through a winter with Kokoraz before. And it's a different experience if you're in an area, of course, that gets snow and uh, winter precipitation. Uh, if you're an experienced observer, we hope this is a good refresher for you. This uh, presentation has been updated this year, probably do some more updates next year, but uh, we're trying to cover all the the facets of measuring and reporting winter precipitation. Um, Noah mentioned that I'm involved in quality control, and one of the things we've discovered in doing quality control of Kokoraz is most observers don't make mistakes actually measuring anything. They don't make a mistake measuring the gauge, catch, or their snow. Uh, the mistakes are usually made in reporting. So, you know, what form they use, where they put the data in the fields, that's where a lot of the mistakes are made. And that's what we're going to address some here in this presentation as far as winter precipitation occurs. So a little bit description on uh, what we're going to be talking about uh, during this presentation. We're going to be covering a lot of material. Um, this presentation is on the Kokoraz website under the slideshow uh, training slideshow menu there on the left hand or right hand side. So you can access this afterwards if you wish to or anytime actually to review it. So what we're going to cover in this presentation is how you prepare for winter measurements. Uh, <clears throat> winter has made its appearance in much of the country already. It's lasted in some areas a lot longer than others, but uh, I know that some observers were initially caught off guard by a sudden onset of winter weather. So we're going to let you know what you should do to help get yourself and your uh, and your observation site ready for winter. We'll talk about precipitation types during the winter and the snow measurement terminology as far as Kokoraz is concerned, what we are calling uh, the different uh, aspects of snow. Uh, measuring and reporting new snowfall. Uh, we'll talk a lot about that and a lot about snow water equivalent and how to measure it. There's a lot of confusion about this. And I hope by the end of this, that uh, if this is something that you're interested in doing, um, you will be able to understand the difference and, and report it correctly. Talk about measuring the snowpack depth, which is your total snow and ice on the ground. And then how to deal with and report freezing rain. And freezing rain is uh, of course a, a real pain um, it's not something you go out sledding in or anything like that, but it, it really presents challenges for observers. And we'll talk about how you can deal with that when it occurs. And then finally, we'll talk about special situations and how to handle them. Um, <clears throat> we don't cover everything. It's an be, we could probably have a whole webinar just on those types of things, but we try and cover the common ones. And then finally, we'll end with some tips 
to help make your job of measuring and reporting snow or snow water equivalent a lot easier. Uh, and a lot of these tips come from observers who have been through this and you know have shared their uh, their shortcuts or tips with uh, with us and with everybody else. So preparing for winter measurements. Um, when you're in a cold weather climate uh, where you're going to receive snow occasionally during the winter and it stays below freezing, uh, especially at night for, uh, you know, for most of the season, it's a really good idea to bring in your funnel and your inner, inner measuring tube in from the uh, outer cylinder and just leave it inside. If water does freeze in the inner tube, it could crack or break your tube uh, <clears throat> because of the, it's only a one inch diameter. If water freezes in the out, outer tube, uh, it can actually accumulate quite a bit. I've had as much as an inch and a half of ice in the outer tube and it doesn't damage it because there's ample room for it to expand, especially if the freezing is rapid. So uh, bring your uh, inner tube and funnel in from the, uh, from the gauge. Now we bring the funnel in because if you do have frozen precipitation, you have snow or even sleet, that will quickly clog that funnel. That little <clears throat> opening into the inner tube is only about a quarter of an inch on the funnel. So if snow gets in there early and, and freezes in there or clogs in there, and you're gonna lose a lot because it's all gonna overflow the funnel and you won't have anything in the gauge. And basically you don't have uh, any kind of observation at that point. And the other thing we suggest for people is to put a simple snow measurement board, what we call a snowboard, uh, out near your rain gauge. It provides you a nice flat surface on which to measure snow. You don't have to worry about the grass underneath, or you don't have to worry about uneven ground at that point. Uh, and then you want to mark that to make sure you know where it is when there's actually snow covering, uh, covering it. Because believe me, you will lose it quickly. In this slide, you see the snowboard clearly visible. I have a little, there's a little reflector there at the corner to mark it and a little dusting of snow on the ground and also on the snowboard. But you can add another half inch of snow and you barely see the snowboard there and another half inch beyond that and you wouldn't see the snowboard. You'd be poking around, searching for it, trying to find out where it is. You can make a snowboard very easily. It takes a one half inch or three quarter inch thick piece of exterior plywood or some other similar material. Uh, regular plywood would work as well, but it probably won't last more than a season uh, because it'll start delaminating. Um, you want to paint it white on both sides on the edge and the edges. There's two reasons for that. One is to increase its reflectivity. So it's not, you're not absorbing sunlight or light onto the snowboard and prematurely melting the snow. And it also helps seal it against the weather. Once you paint it, even with latex paint, um, make sure the edges are sealed so the water can't get wicked in. You're good. And I've had a two by two inch uh, snowboard for probably 10 years now that I paint about every two years and it's been great. So uh, if you have a scrap piece or you get a friend or somebody that can give you some plywood, it's easy to make a snowboard. The other thing it's a good thing to have is a uh, snow stick, but you will need at least a ruler and a yardstick to measure the depth of both new snow and the snow pack. Um, the snow stick is, is graduated in tenths of an inch. Um, you can see uh, both a long and close-up photo of it right here. And uh, typically a 39 inch um, snow stick will suffice for most people, not all, especially if uh, you're, you know, around the Great Lakes or up in Canada in some places, but uh, that's a really handy thing to have. Most rulers are, of course, graduated in, in uh, eighths and sixteenths and halves and quarters. Um, you can convert that to a decimal pretty easily. We actually have a table on our website you can print out and keep handy um, because we report to the nearest uh, tenth. The uh, some I have seen some engineering rulers that are a foot long or eighteen inches long that are marked in tenths. I don't know how easy they are to find anymore, but you could do that if you can find one. But uh, whether your way uh, stocks these snow sticks and they're nice to have if you're gonna be measuring snow. So let's talk about winter precipitation types. <clears throat> there's two basic categories. There's frozen precipitation, and then there's unfrozen precipitation. Unfrozen is basically your rain and freezing rain, which we'll touch on here in a moment. But in the frozen precipitation category, we have uh, 
four different ones we'll talk about here. First is snow. Everybody's familiar with snow. The white ice crystals, they form in super, cool, uh, super cooled cloud droplets freeze up in the cloud. Um, their shapes can be really interesting. They can be uh, um, all sorts of star shapes. We call them dendrites. And it's all dictated by the temperature and level at which uh, which the snowflakes form in the cloud. So, uh, but we're almost getting all familiar with snow and you've seen it light fluffy snow like feathers coming down. And then you see in some storms where um, uh, 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 the um, winter, uh, we get a winter storm and, and the snowflakes are, are really fine and broken apart because they're shattered by the wind. Then we have snow pellets or grapple. And uh, I've seen grapple mentioned in observations and also uh, on Facebook discussions for Coco Ross. But these are small white opaque ice particles that are either round, typically round, sometimes conical in shape. And they're formed when we get super cool water collecting on ice crystals or snowflakes in the cloud. And they quickly bounce when they fall on a hard surface. They're almost hollow and they often break apart. And that's because the layer of ice around, surrounding that snowflake or ice crystal is very thin and fragile. So it doesn't take them much to uh, break apart. And actually I think you'll hear them crunch when you walk on them in some cases, depending on the temperature. This is different from hail. Hail is a different process. Grapple typically forms in the stratiform, stratiform type clouds we get with snowstorms while hail forms in updrafts in thunderstorms. So hail and grapple are not the same and they won't likely occur in the same situation. During the winter, you'll almost always see what looks like hail is grapple. Um, obviously in warmer climates here in the US, uh, down south, you can get hail in the winter. That's not uncommon, but uh, we're talking about frozen precipitation in, in, uh, in winter weather. Then we have what's called snow grains and these are very white, uh, almost to the point you can't see them sometimes though, uh, particles of ice, they're typically flat and elongated a little bit. And, um, and very, I mean, they remind me a lot of drizzle in that we can get like uh, on a day here, we have here in Illinois where it's very foggy and uh, low clouds. Um, and I like to call it snizzle because it is snow, it's ice crystals. And sometimes you can only, see, you can barely see it in the air, but you might see it uh, on your jacket sleeve, or if it's heavy enough and lasts long enough, you'll see it accumulating on our windshields and sometimes on the ground, but it's very fine. And lots of folks will never probably see this. And then we have the other big one for, um, for winter, what we call ice pellets, commonly known as sleet. These are small balls of ice formed from freezing raindrops or the refreezing of melted snowflakes when they fall through a layer of warmer air between the cold air aloft and the cold air below. And they'll refreeze and they'll hit the uh, ground as little balls of ice. Um, they may bounce a little bit, but they're dense enough where they tend to stay put. And the difference between this and uh, grapple, for example, is th this is cl generally clear ice. This will not look like snow or a grapple until it starts accumulating and then, and then it starts looking snow-like. Uh, but it's also very dense. It's hard to drive on. It's a mess. And, uh, but uh, it's, it's definitely one of the second major types of, of uh, frozen precipitation we see here in the US and Canada. The important thing to remember is that for measurement purposes and reporting purposes, these are all treated the same as snow. So if you get sleet, you get an inch of sleet, it doesn't, it, we like to know if it's sleet, you can mention that in your comments, but it doesn't matter as far as measurement is concerned. You would measure that depth of frozen precipitation, in this case sleet, on the ground and report one inch in the snow, 24 hour snowfall column. So all of these are treated as snow. Don't obsess over which one is which when you're actually measuring. It's it's not critical. It's nice if you know the difference. You can tell us in the comments, but it's more important that you measure it as frozen precipitation. And then we'll get to the freezing precipitation or the non-frozen, and we discriminate between freezing and not and frozen. As freezing means it's freezing after it hits the ground. 
Freezing rain occurs when the surface temperature is at or below freezing, but the raindrops become super cooled as they fall through a layer of cold air near the surface, but above that warm layer. And because that warm layer is typically shallow, uh, they freeze upon impact with the surfaces below freezing uh, on the ground. And of course, coat everything with ice, um, trees, power lines, sidewalks, driveways, roads, um, and can create quite a hazardous and dangerous condition. It's, it is liquid precipitation. It falls as a liquid because it does not turn to ice until it hits something on the ground. So you measure it and report it the same way as you would rain after you've melted all that ice in the gauge. And we'll talk more about this later on uh, uh, in the presentation about measuring freezing rain. If this is a topic that interests you though, <clears throat> We are uh, conducting a pilot project to measure ice accretion from freezing rain. We use the simple tools as we try to do here in Kokoraz. We use a dowel, a wooden dowel, and a pair of inexpensive calipers to uh, uh, collect, as you say, to collect the ice on the dowel and then measure and report it. The neat thing about this um, pilot project is you can submit photos along with your measurements and descriptions. This is a pilot project. You won't find this as a regular reporting thing on the website. And if you're interested in participating in this, um, contact Noah. His email here is on the slide, noah.newman at colostate.edu. And he can set you up and show you what you need to do to get started uh, participating in this pilot. We're going into the second year on it and um, trying to collect enough data to to refine things and, and get this set up to, but whereas in the future, we hope this will be one of the regular things you can report um, on the website for winter precipitation. So let's talk about a little bit of terminology uh, with respect to coca rise. Gauge catch. Two years ago, I think it was now, um, we really went in and, and honed in on definitions of the parameters we have in Kokoraz on our input form and on our reports to make everything um, consistent, which we weren't before. So we don't call it daily precipitation anymore. We distinguish it by calling it gauge catch. And this is the amount of water in your gauge measured after it is melted. So if you have a snow event and there's snow in your gauge, you melt that and then measure it and report that as your gauge catch. Then we have our 24 hour snowfall. This is the maximum depth of new snow in the past 24 hours. And typically that's you know observation time to observation time. So uh, pretty self-explanatory for the most part. And we'll get into some details on that as we go through this as well. Then we have our 24 hour snowfall, snow water equivalent. And this is the amount of water measured from melting a core of snow obtained from the snow on the ground perhaps on your snowboard, at the depth of the 24 hours snowfall. For example, if you had three inches of new snow, you would take that core where the depth was three inches, you would melt it and measure it and report it as your snow water equivalent. SWE or snow water equivalent is not your gauge catch. All right, even if the event is all snow, if you don't actually take a core of snow, melt it and measure it, then you do not have SWE for our purposes on the form. Um, so keep that in mind because we have a, a lot of observers that are confused about that. They think if they get all snow, melt what's in the gauge. Well, of course, that makes sense that it might be your snow water equivalent, but it isn't until you actually measure it off a core of snow taken from the ground. So we'll talk about this a lot more as we get into specifics. And then we have our snowpack depth, which is the total depth of new and old snow and ice at observation time. So we shortened the name of that because that explanatory sentence was the old field name for that. So now we can just call it snowpack depth. And this, then we have snowpack snow water equivalent, which is very similar to the new snow water equivalent. It's the amount of water measured for melting a core of snow obtained from the snowpack that's equal to the snowpack depth. Again, we'll talk about that further. So we have our daily precipitation. Your snow is precipitation, but not all precipitation is snow. So the most important measure that you can get if you decide to do nothing else is the amount of water in your rain gauge, your gauge catch. 
you know, if it's snow or freezing rain, or not freezing rain, but if it's snow or sleet, you have to, or and freezing rain, you need to melt it before you measure it. Um, you might have three inches of snow or four inches of snow, and that may melt down to a quarter inch of water. But that's your daily gauge catch. That's your precipitation slash gauge catch. And it gets entered in the gauge catch field on your on the website form and also on the um, mobile apps. So at this point, I think, uh, Noah, if we have any questions, we'll break here. We're going to do this during this presentation, by the way. After every section or so, we'll stop and take any pertinent questions for that uh, previous section of while they're still fresh in your mind. So feel free to ask questions along the way, type them in and, and uh, Noah will uh, we'll relay those and we'll answer those live. Can you hear me, Steve? I can. All right. Yeah, um, no questions came in about um, uh, any of the equipment or the definitions so far, but one question did come in uh, that I, I'll answer out loud, uh, they asked about what, how to count uh, frost that accumulates on the even on the inside of your gauge, and if you bring it inside and, and melt mm. that, that can sometimes accumulate to an inch or a hundredth of an inch. And the the real answer is that uh, in broad terms, frost is something that is condensing and rather than than falling from the from the a cloud, and and therefore in in our case, we do not count frost as precipitation, but there is a way to report frost coverage uh, through a link in the left hand menu of your data entry page. So, um, the, but a, a, there are there is a question. Let me ask it, Steve, uh, for you. Uh, can I place my snowboard on a small table off the ground? Because like, let's say I've got a dog yeah. that, that runs around the yeah. backyard and I've just got no other way to to put out a snowboard. If the, if the snowboard is just sort of hanging in the air there, if it's on top of a picnic table, uh, that would work probably. But if it's subject to updrafts, if there's air that could circulate around it and disturb the settling of the snow on that snowboard, then I would say no. If, if the table is the same size or just slightly bigger than the um, snowboard, that really won't work. Uh, unless it's very close to the ground, like an inch or so, or two inches. But in general, uh, we want them on the ground because when they're up off the ground, then you get, it won't take much before uh, air currents and wind start disturbing the, uh, the accumulation of snow on the board. But if you have Thanks. like a picnic table out back or a patio table, that would work as long as it's not too close to the house and it's not gonna get blow off from your roof or something. Good. Thank you. There's uh, some other questions, but I think you're going to actually get to that throughout the presentation. So I'll let, right. I'll, I'll let those go, but I'll also try to answer them um, uh, as you talk too. So okay, thanks. Yeah. Good question about the snowboard because that one has come up a couple of times. So what is your 24 hour snowfall? <clears throat> the definition pretty much says it, and it says it again here, that maximum accumulation of new snow and ice in the past 24 hours prior to melting or settling. And it's important to remember that. So when do you measure new snow? Well, logical question. Well, you measure it at your observation time. Well, maybe, but more often than not, you won't be. You wanna measure it as soon as possible after it ends, before it settles too much or melting occurs. Now this often will not be at your regular observation time. And so if you measure it in the evening, because the snow has stopped, no more snow is expected, um, you can measure it then, but you still report it at your regular observation time. It's sort of similar to if you have a big thunderstorm in the afternoon, it clears up, you go out and read it, you know, at five o'clock, it said 1.5 inches of rain. Well, you won't report that till the next morning on your regular ob, but you read it early. And this is similar to that, but it's even more important for snow that you try and measure it as soon as possible after it ends. Um, note that we don't ever measure the depth of snow in the rain gauge cylinder, in the outer cylinder. Don't, uh, you don't wanna, we're not want people to stick a ruler into the cylinder and measure the depth of snow. Um, it doesn't accumulate well in there, um, and it's not—it's not snow. It's not measuring snow depth. It's just sticking a ruler in a cylinder. So, any precipitation in the rain gauge has to be melted, and then measured. So, let's look at a typical snow event. <clears throat> it's Monday at 7 a.m., 
and you take your observation and there was no precipitation. So later on in the morning though, snow begins roughly around 9 a.m. and it snows for several hours and ends around 1 p.m. in the afternoon. And at that point, there's 2.4 inches of snow on your snowboard. And then the afternoon goes on and the sun comes out and we get some melting and settling of that snow throughout the rest of the afternoon and overnight. So by the next time the next morning rolls around, there's 1.2 inches of snow on the snowboard. What's your new snowfall? It's the 2.4 inches, because what you want, would like you to measure snow as close to one o'clock as possible or when it ends. You do not clear the snowboard at that point. And then the next morning, if you've measured it at that time, that's your maximum snowfall. And what's on the ground, if that's all there is on the ground is 1.2 inches, then that would be your snowpack depth, or more likely 1.0 rounded down. So we would like you to measure it as soon as possible after the snow ends. We'll look at one more um, situation like this, and then we'll talk about some caveats to all this. This is multiple snow events. Let's say it snows like it did earlier. It ends at one o'clock, but then snow restarts again at 7 p.m. And by a little after midnight, 1230, there's three and a half, 3.6 inches of snow on the board. You can measure the snow then uh, if you're up and around, which is always a good idea. And then by the next morning, there's only 3.4 inches because it's settled somewhat, it compressed. So what do you report? You report 3.6 inches as your snowfall, your 24 hour new snowfall, and you would report the 3.4 inches, assuming that's all that's on the ground, uh, as your snowpack. The point here is you try and measure as soon as possible after it ends, and you do not clear your snowboard until your observation time. Now, someone's gonna say, well, I'm not ever home at one in the afternoon because, or four in the afternoon or noon because I'm at work. And we realize that. Um, and therefore, uh, if you know, for example, that it snowed three inches during the afternoon, but it all melted by 6 p.m., you never had a chance to measure it. Well, then you can't, re we don't want an estimate in that snowfall field. We want a measurement, but you can indicate in your comments that uh, you know, you had three inches of snow, but it all disappeared by, you know, 6 p.m. because the sun came out and it warmed up or whatever the circumstances are. And there will be times where it snows overnight and stops and you're not going to be able to go out and measure it right away. In that case, you know, you measure what you have. Um, if you suspect that the snow's melted or settled since then, then you can indicate that in your comments. But whatever you measure at observation time, you would report as your new snowfall. This isn't a perfect system. We don't have people on duty 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So, and everybody has constraints on when they can do this, but if possible, we would like you to measure it when that snowfall occurs. So where do you measure 24 hour snowfall? Well, hopefully if you have a snowboard, uh, that's the best spot, especially if it's not subject to drifting or melting. And that's why we use a snowboard. Uh, it does minimize melting. Um, there are cases where I've gone out and my snowboard has plenty of snow on it, but most of the stuff in the grass has melted because, you know, it's, it's a little warmer and that dark surface absorbs the energy and helps melt the snow. So the white snowboard really helps in that case. So you find a good spot. And if you don't have a snowboard, you have to find a nice level place to measure. Uh, even a, a, a picnic table top is okay as long as it's not uh, affected by the wind too much or you're not getting blow off from the roof of your house or garage. Um, you put your snow stick or ruler into the snow until it reaches the snowboard surface and you measure to the nearest tenth of an inch. For example, 3.4 inches. Um, this is Nolan measuring snow and I can't tell what he's measuring there, but it looks like the cylinder is halfway in. So that's probably around five inches of snow that he's measuring there. But you wanna make three or four measurements, even on a snowboard and average them. Uh, it's not uncommon where you can have a half inch on one edge of the snowboard and three quarters or an inch on the other, depending on wind and other things. So you wanna make sure you take three or four and average them. And if all four are the same, then you're, you're all set. It's really easy. It's easy to average that. And then at that point, if it's your observation time, you sweep the snowboard clean. All right, make sure there's no more snow on it because you want to make it ready for the next 24 hour period. 
So clean, what you do after you clean it off, you want to place it on top of uh, the snow. In this case, the snowboard is lined with uh, blue uh, painter's tape just to make it a little bit more visible in the snow. Now, if you're in a case, uh, uh, snow here is about five inches deep and it looks like with a fairly wet snow. So the board sits on top. But if you're in an area that gets all, uh, you know, gets a foot of light, fluffy snow, like they did in Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska this past week, um, you drop your snowboard in the snow, it may sink in there. We don't want the snowboard in a pit. So if, um, because the wind will affect that, it can drift it over. Um, It'll shield it a little bit. So if you if you have a light, fluffy snow and can't get the snowboard to sit on top, then pack the snow down in an area around the snowboard with the snowboard. You can use the snowboard to push it down and pack it down a little bit far enough out so there's a large margin that isn't going to be sticking up over the snowboard. And just leave your snowboard there. If if it's marked, it'll be easy to find. So just in case you encounter that situation. So when you measure your 24 hour snowfall, you enter it in the field on the form. And then uh, comments, and we're gonna say this a lot during this presentation, comments are always and very helpful in any situation, not just winter, but summer as well. But winter with this complicated measurements, um, uh, it really helps to, to discern what happened. So in this case, the observer uh, commented, not much wind with this storm of fluffy snow. So we can be fairly confident that the 6.2 inches is a really good measurement because the snow probably came straight down. Now, this is the web form. This is what we find on the web. If you're reporting on the mobile app for Android, after you enter your precipitation, you need to click on, uh, click to uh, specify snow and flooding info. And that will take you to the next screen, which will be your uh, snow and total snow and ice. Um, the terminology on the, on the mobile apps hasn't jived completely with what we've redesigned, but eventually it will. And you enter it and then after you finish in your snow and the other uh, parameters, you click submit and your OBS in. It's a little bit different on the iOS app. There's a second step you have to do, and this 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 uh, gets there gets people all the time, unfortunately. But after you enter your precipitation, your rain and melted snow, you then click done, and then after clicking done, you click more details, and that'll take you to the snow entry screen. So if you don't click done, you could lose your precipitation. You'll enter your snow, you'll come back and your precipitation will be gone. So you have to enter it again. Just make sure you click done and then go to details on the iOS app. Um, I use Android when I use it. So um, hopefully this is still current, I believe it is, but just remember that there is a difference there and be careful as you're, uh, as you're entering. And always, and this goes for winter, summer, spring and fall, Check your observation after you enter it. Take a quick look. Is this what I intended to enter so that you're not entering uh, 10 inches when you meant an inch and things like that. Little things like that uh, can get, get through. It happens to everybody, but it also helps if you check your ob after every, after every entry. Okay, what do you do if it's snowing during, you know, you're measuring, you want to measure snow during the storm, during the uh, snowstorm, the National Weather Service really appreciates um, significant weather reports. And, you know, those are supplemental reports. You can submit as few or as many as you need to, to let them know what's going on. Um, what you need to do is go out and, you know, it started snowing. It's been two hours. You go out and measure the snow, write down the time of your measurement and the amount. And then you enter that on a significant weather report. All those significant weather reports are routed to the nearest national, your local National Weather Service office. So that's why we like to see those come in. It really helps them. And they use those all the time to monitor the storm. Important thing to remember is for these supplementary measurements, do not clean off the snowboard. Leave the snow on it. Take your measurements, write them down and leave the snowboard as it is. You should only clear it once every 24 hours at your regular observation time. So I think Noah, we can pause here and see if there's any questions about the 24 hour snowfall measurement. Um, nothing specific. I've been answering a few on the side, but I think we're just doing great. I think you should just keep on continuing on. This is great. All right, let's roll on. So we're going to get into talking about snow water equivalent, which is our 
point of emphasis this year, as I like to call it. <clears throat> and I first want to talk about the 10 to 1 myth. And this has been around forever. In fact, at one point, um, there were actual instructions for using this for determining snowfall, which never has been correct. Even when they were using it, it wasn't correct. But uh, we want to get rid of this because this is a myth. Uh, we don't want anybody estimating the snowfall by converting the liquid in the rain gauge to a snowfall amount, whether using 10 to 1 or some other table that might be out there. And I know they're out there because I've seen them and I actually have one that can uh, cor correlates the snow to a certain surface. Like if it's 22 degrees, then you use this snow conversion factor. Doesn't That doesn't work. Um, and uh, we don't want anybody doing that. And we can tell when we have observers that are consistently reporting 10 to 1 because 10 to 1 doesn't occur that often. This map is a climatology of snow to water ratios that was compiled by uh, some researchers at St. Louis University. And um, the only area that really consistently climatologically has a 10 to one um, ratio is that area where the dark blue and the light blue meet. That is the 10 to one area. As you can see, the entire Rockies, most of the West, upper Midwest and Northeast, have ratios that are typically higher, like 11, 12, 13, 14 to one. So do not use 10 to one. It's, it's, it does occur, and I'm not saying it won't, and it can occur tomorrow here, for example, but it doesn't happen very often. The, it's dependent on many factors. The reason it doesn't work is there's a lot of different things that go into what makes the snow dry or wet. Um, it's the temperature in the clouds, the temperature of the surface, how much wind there's going on, um, uh, a whole host of things that happen within the cloud, which we call cloud physics, that can determine that. This, the ratio can develop, uh, can vary from storm to storm, and I've actually had it happen within the same storm, where I measured snow one morning where it was 13 to 1, and later in the afternoon, the snow was coming down at a ratio of about 8 to 1. So even within the same storm, it can change, and it varies all over the place. Your dry, fluffy, cold snows that occur when the temperature in the teens or single digits um, can be very dry. It can be 20 to 1 or even 25 to 1 in some, some cases. Snows that occur uh, early in the season where the temperature is marginally freezing, uh, there's a lot of warm air and moisture aloft, those can be very, uh, very low ratios of 8 to 1 or 7 to 1. So you cannot use this 10 to 1 thing for anything other than uh, a conversation starter. So why do, how do we determine what, how much water is in the snow? Well, we measure what's called the 24-hour snow water equivalent. And I'm going to refer to it as SWE at this point, because uh, it's easier to say. But again, we go back to the definition. The 24-hour snow water equivalent is a distinct and separate measurement from the amount in your rain gauge. If you do not physically measure SWE, you don't enter anything in that field, OK? Now, I meant to mention this earlier, but this is an optional measurement. All snow parameters are optional. If you, as an observer, don't want to mess with snow in the winter, but you're willing to go out there and bring your gauge in and melt it and measure and report it, that's great. Um, lots of people don't want to be getting out in the, in the winter weather for whatever reason. And uh, so you don't have to do this. But if you do do it, we want it done correctly. That's the main, uh, main, main point here. Um, the 24-hour SWE uh, may not be the same as your gauge catch. It may be at some times if you physically measure it, but your gauge catch is not your snow water equivalent. The amount melted from your rain gauge, your gauge catch includes everything that falls, rain, snow, sleet, uh, and that's what you report in your gauge catch for your daily precipitation. We don't need to know necessarily, you don't have to parse out how much water was from sleet or how much water was, was from snow, how much water was from rain. We just want that total. But the snowfall SWE really only includes that part of your total precipitation that was snow or sleet. This is important for a number of reasons. Uh, hydrologists and forecasters use this value when they see it. <clears throat> and uh, uh, we'll talk more about that as we get further into SWE for both snowfall and snowpack. Again, and I was um, keep reiterating this, this is not the amount you melt in your rain gauge. Uh, and we've 
been really fuzzy about this in the past, and that's partly, and uh, this is Kokoraz uh, not being very uh, clear about what this is and or how this works. So um, we've been starting to email observers who consistently have their SWE, the same as your gauge catch, questioning that, uh, seeing if they actually did do a core. So if you get that kind of email, don't be offended um, when there's three or 400 snow observations and uh, 250 have their uh, gauge catch the same as their snow or uh, as their snow water equivalent makes it a little daunting to contact everybody. But um, the point is, uh, it is not the amount melted in your rain gauge. And some people said, well, the, it, it was just all snow. Oh, you only had, we didn't have rain or, or freezing rain or anything else. It was just snow. So my gauge catch is my snow water equivalent, right? No, snow water equivalent is a separate measurement. And if you keep that in mind, you should be able to keep it straight pretty easily. So how do we do that? You take a core of snow using the outer cylinder and then melt and measure that core. And again, it may be the same as your gauge catch. In some cases it is, but more often than not, there will be a difference. So when do we measure 24 hour SWE? Well, when do we measure 24 hour snowfall? Again, ideal situation is to measure it as soon as possible after the snow stops, because then you're, you're getting, you're right there and getting what you, what you need to get in terms of snow depth and SWE. And it, again, it won't be necessarily at your normal observation time. If you say, well, I'll go out and measure the snow, but I'll wait for SWE until the morning. Well, if you wait until the morning, a number of things could happen or during your next observation time. It could rain on top of that snow and the snow melts or the snow melts and you don't have anything to measure. Um, typically in some, especially in the mid, mid continent storms we get, you know, the low pressure will come in, we'll get some snow. And then as the cold air comes in, the winds really pick up and it starts blowing the snow everywhere. Whereas during the snowstorm itself, it might've been a nice even snow, but once the winds kick in, that could drift over your snowboard, erode the snow depth, and you won't have what you need to uh, measure the snow water equivalent. And as we alluded to earlier from that earlier questions, you could have critters walking across your snowboard, dogs, cats. And in my case, I have to worry about deer and, and rabbits uh, hopping across the board. But um, uh, typically those types of things could happen. And if that happens and you don't have a good place to measure that SWE um, and you wait too long, you're not gonna get an accurate measurement, even if you do measure it. So how do we take a core of new snow off the snowboard? Again, snowboard is the easiest way to do this. Again, if you have a hard surface like a picnic table or something, that's good too. Typically, we don't want you doing it on a concrete surface like a sidewalk or driveway because um, depending on exposure, that, can, that has a high thermal mass. And if it's sunny out before the storm, it could warm up. Um, snow on that could melt faster than you know, let's say over the grass and you see that all the time. So you wanna have something that's uh, um, well exposed and on a hard surface. You wanna take your core after you measured your snow depth because that will tell you where you have to take your core. But uh, don't clear the board until obviously after you take your core. So if you determine the depth of the new snow is four inches, then you can take your core sample from an area where the depth of snow is four inches. If you take it somewhere else at a different depth, you're not getting a one-to-one -one match on depth and snow water equivalent. And generally there's no need to take a core of, or even try to take a core of new snow when there's only a trace of snow and even a couple of tenths. Um, sometimes during the season, you'll get little snow squalls. They'll come up, drop a quick tenth of an inch of snow and uh, you can measure it, but it's really hard to collect that sometimes. And at, that, at those amounts, it's not that significant. So um, don't feel you have to go out and collect every snowflake that comes to try and determine the snow water equivalent. So here's some photos and descriptions on how you do this. You capture a core by first inverting the outer cylinder and pushing it straight down into the snow over your snowboard. And then it's a good idea to clear the snow out from around the cylinder 
as shown here in this bottom photo. So you're not <clears throat> trying, not pushing any new snow underneath. And then use something thin to slide under the cylinder. Uh, you can use a spatula, um, a snow swatter available at Weather Your Way, or something equally as thin that you can slide under without pushing snow away. And then once you've captured it with the spatula, for example, just invert that cylinder and trap the snow inside of it. Then you bring the snow inside and uh, you see your cylinder full of snow, your core sample, and then you can melt that and measure that. And that's what you report as your snowfall, snow water equivalent. We're gonna talk about weighing your sample here later on. So if you're interested in hearing about that, hang on, we will be talking about that. So you measure and melt, you report your snow water equivalent in that field rare right below the snowfall. And then comments are always useful, especially if they're the same. If you, if you actually do this core and you say, wow, it's the same as my gauge catch. One, that's good. Two, tell us in the comments. Because uh, we right now don't have anything to let you acknowledge that you've taken a core. That's going to change eventually in the future. So if you can, put a comment in your observation saying that snowfall SWE is the same as gauge catch. And then that tells us, yes, you you uh, you did take a core and uh, and do it the correct way. So we'll stop here, Noah, and take any questions on this because this is a can be a confusing topic. So we'd like to clear anything up before we get too far along in that. Um, well, uh, I've been answering them on the side, but uh, just as we're talking here, one did pop up as far as you know. You're talking about the melt and measure. Uh, mm -hmm. method of adding a pre-measured amount of hot water and uh, and that of course melts the snow immediately and you subtract the, what you added etc but this person is asking about um, just kind of what if they want to just stick it next to the heat register or something like that does uh, you know I mean in my opinion that would take a long time and but two yeah. would you lose some to evaporation I mean let's say it's not going to precipitate might. the next day is it yeah, you might, especially, you know, in the winter, our homes tend to be very dry because the heat dry. I mean, we're not talking about humidity at 50%. We're talking sometimes down at 10 or 20% if it's really cold. So you could get some evaporation loss. It probably wouldn't be significant, but uh, we'll show you some methods for speeding this up. I mean, adding hot water will do that. It, it gets a little messy because you got to keep track of what you add. You got to subtract it. Um, we'll show you another way where you still have to use a little bit of math, but it's a lot easier uh, to measure this, especially if you have something like a kitchen scale in your kitchen. So we'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, you can leave it sit out. You don't have to put it in your register. You can leave it sit out. Do not put it in your microwave because you will not only lose your snow sample, you'll lose your gauge probably as well because it will melt into a weird mass. Um, uh, but in general, you can set it in a tub of warm water to accelerate. There's other ways to do that, but or just let it sit on the counter till it finally uh, melts. But that takes a long time. You can tend to forget about it. And But if you do yeah. that, that's fine. You just go in later and enter your amount. Okay. okay. I'm going to answer a few others on the side, but I do want to, I'll, I'm going to field one more to you right now because sure. The instructions for uh, uh, taking your your core of, of new snow, um, and let's say it, you know, you're in one of those situations where it stopped in the middle of the day, and you're you, you go out there, but mm -hmm. you do not. The instructions are to not clear the snowboard, but at the same right. time, you've got to kind of get your spatula under there. How do you? How, yeah, uh, that right. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, just be a little careful. If you know, for example, that it's not going to snow anymore, you know, the storm's over, stars are out. Um, you can do that and not worry about it you know, messing up the snowboard anymore. Um, but uh, I tend to do it off to the side where this depth is the same. Or you can find a different surface. Um, if you have Okay, let's say you have a snowboard and there's four inches on it. You have a picnic table and there's four inches on it. You could take your core off of that as long as it's the same depth as the snow that's on the snowboard or whatever you determine as your snowfall. So, but yeah, that's a good question. You could mess up your snowboard. Um, typically, we do this in the morning with our regular Rob, uh, all depending. But uh, yeah, just um, 
just be careful. And if, for example, you accidentally do clear your snowboard or mess it up, just put it on top of this new, the old snow, make sure it's on top. And if you get some additional snow overnight, you can still measure and, and deal with it. But um, yeah, don't uh, just do the best you can. And you know, if you can get that core off of there without worrying about it, that's great. All right, Steve, keep on moving along then. And uh, I'll keep on answering some questions on the side. All right, thanks, Noah. We're gonna talk next about measuring snowpack depth. Uh, that's the total snow and ice on the ground. All right, come on here, buddy. There we go. Uh, snowpack depth is the average depth of snow, both old snow and ice, as well as the new snow that remains on the ground at observation time. And you wanna report that every day there is snow on the ground. So you get a nice snowstorm like this one in the photo. Uh, which is a nightmare to look at because you got bare ground, you got huge drifts, you got low drifts, you got average snow across the street there, um, quite the variation. But uh, the sun is out and it, you, know, you get sunny skies and cold weather the next week. We'd like you to do this every day, take the, the snow depth measurement, snowpack depth and report that. That is really beneficial to uh, a lot of uh, um hydrologists and forecasters for knowing how much water is sitting on the ground. And we'll talk more about why that's important later. Measuring snowpack depth is really can be tricky. It's not a perfect thing. It's, it's in a way subjective. Uh, you do some estimating in it, you know, estimate how much more, how much of the ground is covered. Are you picking the correct area to measure in? That's sort of an estimate. Um, it's really hard because you're not measuring only where you had the new snow, you're measuring you know, everything. So you look at this photo here of, of a post-storm snow. This is the morning after a snowfall and look at how the wind has, has changed that, uh, that snowscape there. I, this is the first time and only time I've seen something like this. Uh, and this is around near where I live. Um, but how do you measure that? Well, you have to take a number of measurements, both in the deeper areas and in the shallower areas and uh, average them out. So it's really uniform in coverage. And I don't care where you are um, after, if you get snow frequently and you have actually accumulating a snowpack that lasts for a while, um, it will not be uniform. You know, right after the snow, you could pretty much determine if you only had one snow, whatever is your new snow is your snow depth probably. Um, but uh, it's rarely uniform and lots of things go into that. You can get compression and compacting of the snow. Uh, the wind can do that. Um, melting and the wind can do that. You've got melting occurring at different rates uh, depending on the actual snow depth. You have wind, you have uh, sun exposure. Snow will melt faster on the south side of a hill or incline than it will on the north side. Um, and depending on what, what's uh, underlying that snow, is it grass? Is it uh, bare ground like a plowed field which has been tilled during the fall and now all showing is black dirt? That's going to melt a lot faster than an adjoining field, for example, that's covered in a cover crop or uh, our grass. So lots of things go into it. So this, we don't get, we try not to get obsessed about being precise about this. We want to be accurate, but we don't want to get too crazy about uh, getting down to the point where you're thinking, I, I guess can't do this because it's too confusing and complicated. It really isn't. We're trying to get a representative value for the snowpack in an area, meaning we're not looking to get one spot in your backyard to find out what the snow depth is. But whatever you report should be representative of the area around you. How do you define area? That's again, another subjective thing. For me, I have about uh, two or three equal size lots around me and I can look out and I can see what the snow is doing in that general area. And I try and, and measure the snow so it's representative of that area. Um, if you have can only measure, let's say between your front yard and your backyard, then you should measure in both areas because uh, if one's exposed on the south and one's exposed on the north, that they're going to have different rates of melting and, and compacting and all that. So what I get at here is we don't really want to have a second snowboard in one location for your snowpack measurement. And I know some observers do this and <clears throat> to the point where they, that's all they refer to. As long as snow is on that snowboard, they're reporting snow depth, even if um, 
a lot of snow on the grass and stuff is melted around them. So we don't want, it's not that important for a point. We want to see it to generally represent the area because that's what the people that use the data are looking for. Uh, so keep that in mind what the purpose of this is. And again, we don't know, get obsessed about getting super precise about it, but we do want to be measure it as accurately as we can. So how do you do this? We well, take several measurements to obtain your snowpack depth. And um, if you see the snow is, you know, even on a, in a large area, you'll see the snow has different depths. You can see slight areas where it's accumulated deeper and lower areas where it hasn't accumulated as much, usually due to the wind. So you want to make you sample those areas. How many observations you make depends on how big your area is, how many you want to do. Um, how many you think it'll take to really tell you what the snow depth is. Write them down though. Um, have a notebook and a pencil and write them down as you make them. Uh, you slide your snow thick through all of the layers of snow, both new and old. And <clears throat> then you read it to the nearest, you can read your snow stick to the nearest 10th. We round it to the nearest half inch for reporting snowpack. Um, we don't need more precision than that, put it that way. Uh, some people are reporting it to the nearest tenth on the form, and we don't we don't come at you for that. We don't we don't say no, no no don't do that it's bad. If people do that we allow it, but that really is a sort of a false precision. You really can't get that accurate uh, with measuring snowpack depth in general. We don't want you to measure artificial accumulations such as uh, you know stuff along your driveway that was plowed, um, exceptionally large drifts like those produced like those uh, along the side of a house or a fence row is something actually help produce that drift like a fence or the side of a house. If you have lar areas with large amounts of snow that were naturally just from the wind blowing, um, then you can measure some of those. Don't measure where snow has been shoveled. Um, if you clear your driveway with a snow thrower and it throws the snow 20 feet into your yard, make sure you're not measuring where that snow was deposited from your snow thrower. You wanna measure what we call natural snow. Once you make your measurements, you average them and that's your snowpack depth and you report it on the form to the nearest half inch. Now you're gonna, because snowpack varies and it, it melts and, and changes at different rates, you're gonna have some days where it's only gonna, eventually, where it's only gonna partially cover the ground. Um, for some areas up north, it takes 60 days or more before they see something like this. In some other areas, after every snowstorm, you get something like this. Uh, you'll see snow and you'll see bare ground. Well, how do you do this? How do you, how do you deal with this in terms of measuring and reporting snow depth? Well, you measure the average snow depth in the areas that do have snow, and then multiply it by the percent of the area the snow covers. Again, we're talking about estimates. You have to estimate how much of the ground is still covered with snow. Again, it's your best estimate. We don't, you don't have to go to a map or a satellite photo and try and figure it out. Just do your best estimate. So say, for example, that 60% of the ground has around two inches of snow. The rest of the ground is bare. What we would report for the uh, snowpack depth is two times 0 0.6, which is 60%, or 1.2 inches. And the actual report would be 1.0 because we round that to the nearest inch or half inch rather, and that would be the half, nearest half inch. If more than half the ground is bare, doesn't matter how much snow is on the remaining uh, portion of the snow, if it's 60% bare and 40% snow, you just report a trace of snowpack depth. And then you can mention how deep the snow is in your comments if there's snow in other areas. As long as there is, uh, um, you will we'll go on. This is where you report it. Excuse me. Um, snowpack depth field, and then underneath, we'll we'll talk about snowpack sweet here in a second. But when snowpack depth is less than a half inch, you average everything, and it comes out to uh, you know zero point two or or less than or less than zero point five. You enter a trace for snowpack depth. And you report a trace until there is no natural snow remaining in the area. Um, if you have a 10 by 10 patch of snow out in the yard somewhere, everything else is gone. As long as that snow is there naturally, and it wasn't 
you know, put there by a plow or a shovel or a snow thrower or whatever, the kids building a snow fort that's melting, um, report a trace until it's gone. One thing when you're measuring snowpack is you're not going to be measuring that on a snowboard for the most part or a hard surface. You're going to be measuring over grass or some field. So you have to, this is another reason this is not a precise measurement because there are so many things working against precision here. But we want you to be as accurate as possible. So if you're measuring on a grassy surface, be careful. You, snow, especially if it's a light, fluffy snow, may perch on top of the grass and sit on top of it and you'll have two inches or three inches of grass and air underneath. So when you measure, you want to make sure you're measuring the snow layer only, not the snow layer plus the grass and air underneath. And if you're not sure, you can clear away an area of snow with your hand so you can see the edge of the snow uh, and where it meets the grass. And then you can hold your ruler along that and measure it. Um, those situations will occur. But eventually, if you've got a snowpack that's been there for a couple of days, uh, it'll be down to the ground. Um, this is typically initially when you get a new snow or something that you might find something like this. So the next thing we'll talk about is measuring uh, snowpack, snow water equivalent. This is a measurement that's really useful for hydrologists and river forecasters, especially during the late winter and spring when they're starting to prepare their flood forecasts or flood outlooks. What this tells them is how much water is sitting on the ground. Okay. They know they have three inches of water sitting there in the form of snow and ice on the ground, and we're going to be expecting three inches of rain. That's a much different impact if we just get three inches of rain and there's no snow. So this becomes very important, and it's why we encourage people to do this if at all possible. Um, because it provides that estimate, um, it gets plugged into their river forecast models, and uh, it's used extensively by the National Operational Hydrologic Remote Sensing Center up in Chanhass, Minnesota, which monitors snowfall and snowpack and ingests all our Kokoraz observations into their data as well. Um, so it's used extensively. And the good thing about this is it doesn't have to be done every day. You know, some folks say, well, I don't want to have to go out there and measure this and this and this every day and take this many measurements, but you don't have to. We would like you to do snowpack water equivalent once a week, if you can. Uh, measure it after a new snowfall. You've had snow sitting around for six days and then you get a new snow, you can measure it then. But then once a week, and we have something what we promote during the winter called SWE Mondays. And you'll see that on our message of the day and on our other messages. And that's where we ask observers to measure and report snowpack SWE. Every Monday there is snow on the ground. That gives the river forecasters, the river forecast centers, and no risk, which is the research uh, center up in Chanhassen, all the data they can get in one big package. I mean, if everybody's doing it on Mondays, it gives them a really good data set to use. So we really try and promote that. The process for doing this is the same as the 24 hour SWE. You take a core at the average representative depth of the snowpack, you melt it, and you measure and report what you have. Um, you want a location that hasn't drifted over, melted, or blown clear. Uh, you want it at the depth of what you determine your snowpack to be. So if you determine your snowpack to be three inches, take your core sample somewhere in your snowpack that's at a depth of three inches. Um, and you, won't have to, you don't have to do the same spot every day. You won't be able to do the same spot every day if your snowpack is changing. And again, it's very similar to snowfall suite. You place the gauge upside down, push it into the snow, clear the snow from around the gauge, and slide a spatula or snow swatter underneath, capture the snow, flip the gauge, and then bring it inside to melt and measure. And you report this, on, whoop, didn't mean to do that. Um, report this on your daily form there, right below the snowpack depth, and uh, then you're all set. And again, this doesn't have to be done every day. You know, we can do it once a week and that will be, um, plenty to satisfy most data needs. Any questions about snowpack and snowpack suite at this point? Hey, Steve. Um, yes. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's a couple folks asking about uh, just, you know, when they're at the point where they're, 
where everything in the sun is that's been exposed is is melted but there's still mm -hmm. piles of snow in the in the shade do we still mm -hmm. count that and and um i'll i'll just answer out loud that the yeah. you you would report that that now counts as a trace of snowpack on the ground yeah. as long as as long as there's less than 50 per, or more than 50 percent of the ground that's bare you would report a trace and that's gonna, I mean, you're gonna see that a lot. I, I mean, even here, I can I can tell you where snow is gonna melt first and where it's gonna hang around a long time. But um, uh, once it's below 50%, um, then we just report a trace. Yeah. And then the other thing to bring up, and it's it, it's interesting because, you know, we all live in our own, <laughs> in our own world where, you know, I'm in a place where I've got neighbors and I've got a small backyard, um, but other people, they they might live in you know serious rural areas where they might not have neighbors or even other Kokoraz observers for miles mm -hmm. and so when you're considering total snowpack how big of an area are you are you really looking at here well you really have to think about it in two ways one is you know representing the area and then how much of that area can you actually measure? Uh, I mean, you can't go tramping through people's yards to measure snow. Um, you could use that estimate to estimate how much of the area is covered, but you can't practically um, do that for, um, uh, for you know, in a, let's say in an urban area, you can't go tramping through people's yards to, to measure snow. It's just not going to be something that you can do. Um, if you have a larger, you know, I live on an acre and I'm surrounded by a couple acre lots. I, I could probably wander in my neighbor's yards. I have been measured snow once in a while, but generally I can stick to my own uh, place, but I wouldn't venture too far. I mean, I would say, you know, if you're in a couple hundred feet of your lot, that's about as far as you need to go. Um, you know, snow is going to change, you know, a half a mile from here and a mile from here. So um, keep it reasonable. You can't really measure more than you can physically measure. So, uh, but don't think you have to measure, you know, uh, for the six acres around you, or if it changes drastically a mile away uh, because there's a forest or a hillside or something, just concentrate in your own local area. You can always provide descriptions of what you're seeing in your comments. And that's helpful too, uh, especially if somebody's interested in digging into this a little bit more. So comments really help. All right, we'll continue on. And I think we're getting to the special situations here in a, in a few and uh, we'll, we'll save some questions for the end. Okay, sounds good. All right, here we're gonna talk about some special situations you might encounter during the winter. Some of them, this is certainly not all of them, and uh, but some of the more common ones. Um, this, this is the event that, that launched Kokoraz here in Illinois. We launched uh, right after this storm, or actually during the storm was occurring. It was a significant freezing rain uh, ice storm here in central Illinois and parts of northern Illinois, and followed by uh, some significant snow. And this is actually the Lincoln National Weather Service office. And you can see the ice is coating the, the grass there and the trees, and they've got drifts there that are probably two feet deep. And then areas there that are barely a couple, barely an inch deep. So quite a storm. And uh, that would, I definitely would call a special situation. Fortunately, we didn't have to measure it because we were just starting up. So wind is a common issue with snow uh, measurement. Um, and it's worse in some areas than the other. If you're in the central plains, northern plains, parts of the Midwest, uh, we get these storms cranking up and they're just wind driven snow that's horizontal. It makes it really tough. And uh, this is when we just ask everybody to do their best. Um, so what if you have a situation where the amount of snow in the rain gauge is, you can see it's just barely showing up on the bottom, but you know you have several inches of snow on the ground. What do you do in that case? Well, this is where we really rely on Snowfall Suite to help us out. You would, you would want to find, measure your snow depth. And in this case, if we're really wind driven, you're going to have to take several in different areas and measurement because your snowboard might not be, might not have any snow on it. But you want to get a good average of the new snow depth, take a core from that depth, at that depth, and then melt and measure that. And then you could use the 24 hour snow water equivalent uh, as your gauge catch. That's what you'd also report as your gauge catch. Um, 
if you feel this is certainly more representative of the actual precipitation, you know, if it's been snowing for 12 hours and you got a tenth of an inch of water in your gauge, clearly something's not right. So that would tell you that you need to do something else. You can substitute the SWE for your gauge catch at this point, but make a note in your comments to let us know that. And then also let us know what was in your gauge, what your gauge catch was. This is how we'd like you to do it. Um, in the situation where you're using the SWE as your gauge catch, you report the SWE in the gauge catch field, and then you include the melted amount in your comments, along with a comment that you use the, uh, the snow core for your gauge catch because of the wind. And that lets us know what's going on there. Now, this is more common, again, in some areas where it's always windy when it snows. If you get a nice gentle snowfall, you usually don't have to worry about this. So what if snow melts as it falls and never accumulates? And we've all seen that, I think, where early in the season, uh, especially temperatures haven't gotten quite cold enough and you'll get a snow and it snows all day or snows for six hours and everything's just wet and there's no snow. You obviously report what's in your gauge. And this is a common theme, so bear with me here. You report what's in your gauge melted as the gauge catch and then report a trace of new snow. In your comments, write snow melted as it fell. And that tells us you know, what the situation was. You did have snow, but it didn't accumulate. Anything less than a 10th of an inch of snow accumulating is a trace. So if you don't, <clears throat> if it snows all day, and there might be a little coating, but it doesn't even add up to a 10th, it's a trace. Or if it melts, it's a trace. What if you have um, snow or sleet mixed with rain um, and it doesn't actually accumulate on the ground? And we'll see this uh, in places at times as storms along the East Coast see, see mixed precipitation quite a bit, especially along the coast or see a changeover. You report, of course, the precipitation in your gauge as the gauge catch. And then since nothing actually accumulated in terms of frozen precipitation, you report a trace of 24 hour new snowfall. And then again, make a note in your comments that snow and sleet or snow is mixed with rain, but melted as it fell. Same situation, snow and rain are mixed, but now there is snow that accumulates. Report your precipitation as your gauge catch, of course, and then the maximum accumulation of the new snow as your 24 hour snowfall. Again, it's get, best to get this as soon as possible after it ends, before it has a chance to melt. In mixed precipitation situations, especially, temperatures are probably borderline freezing. So if you, don't, if you can't or don't get out there to measure it right away, it could melt uh, before you have a chance to measure it. If you can't measure it before it melts, you don't have a measurement. You have an estimate. You can estimate, oh, I, I think it looked like about two inches fell uh, of snow, but it all melted before I could measure it. You have to enter NA for your snowfall. Um, don't report zero and don't report trace because those are both measurements. Zero is a measurement. So we don't want you that. You just enter NA and then explain it in your comments. And we do read comments. Uh, observers, some observers like to test us and say, well, I bet nobody's reading this. We do read a lot of comments and especially if we have any kind of question or curiosity about an observation. And then make a note you had mixed precipitation in your comments. Even after the fact, some of the weather service offices will use this in the documenting their storms. Uh, on the ground observations are extremely valuable. Radar is great, but it can't tell us everything. Uh, a couple of miscellaneous tips. If snowfall occurs, it's less than a tenth of an inch, it's reported as a trace. It could, might just be a few flurries, um, you could have a light dusting like in a snow squall. Uh, snow does not have to end up in the rain gauge to be called a trace. Just like in the summer, you have a thunderstorm or you have a brief shower and you get sprinkled on in your yard, you go check your gauge and there's not a drop in it, and that happens, you still report a trace of rain. Uh, because it wasn't measurable. In this case, even if you have a single snowflake that falls and lands on your sleeve or on your hat or wherever on your windshield, you would report a trace of new snow at that loca at your location, as long as it's at your location. It doesn't have to end up in the rain gauge. Now, you might have measurable snow of a couple of tenths, and this happens. But 
snow, um, they can happen when the snow is very dry, like if it's very cold and snow squalls, or if it's very windy. And because the snow amount is so small, you're probably not going to be able to take a core sample. And so you, you at the gate, it may, if it uh, melts down to only a trace in the gauge, that's what you would report. And you can mention that, you know, you had actually a tenth of snow that accumulated, but it didn't, you know, amount to a measurable amount in the gauge. And that's certainly possible. Just explain the circumstances in your uh, comments. And then finally, freezing rain. Freezing rain uh, is a pain. Uh, the rhyming unintentional at this point, but it forms in liquid form and freezes on contact with a surface. A gauge like this is really tough to get off the bracket. You have to be very careful that you don't force it and break because you can break that bracket. Uh, if it's ice coated, it will snap, especially in the colder weather. Um, so be very careful. You want to melt and measure the water that is accumulated inside the gauge uh, and report that as your uh, gauge catch. Do not uh, let any of that ice on the outside does not count, right? Let that clear that off, melt that off, and you only melt and measure what's on the inside of the gauge. If you have a uh, chance to do so, you can report the total depth of freezing rain uh, in your observation. It can also be included in the total snow and ice in the ground field on the form because it that is total snow and ice, not just snow. And then make a note in your comments so they know it's freezing rain. Again, if you're really interested in this, check out the pilot project we have going as well. So let's review uh, our snow measurement reporting. Snow measurements, again, are optional. You do not have to do this. But if you do do it, we want you to be careful about reporting and measuring and to do it accurately. If you estimate or snowfall or snow depth, don't enter those estimated values in the fields on the form. Even if you say, well, the snowfall was estimated and you put in 2.0 inches for snow. Estimates don't belong where we want measurements. We want uh, estimates you can put in the comments. So if you had snow, you aren't, didn't have a chance to measure it, but you estimated two inches at the comments. Um, that helps us in lots of other ways um, in terms of interpreting what's going on. So when we get our gauge catch, it goes in that field and that's where uh, all the precipitation melted from your gauge goes. Snowfall goes in the 24 hour snowfall field and snow water equivalent goes right below that in the snowfall sweep field. Again, if you do not take a core and physically measure the snow water equivalent, it does, that field should be left NA. We do not copy our gauge catch into that field under any circumstances. Measure your snowpack depths and report that accordingly on the form. And then your snowpack snow water equivalent, again, optional. And um, even if you do snowfall sweep uh, for the new snow, you don't have to do snowpack sweep. It's helpful, but you don't have to. Um, so that's where you enter things on the form. The last section we're gonna cover is some winter measurement tips. An extra outer cylinder is a real time saver. And if you haven't, if you haven't, don't have an extra outer cylinder and you're measuring snow, seriously think about getting one. You can get by just a cylinder from weatheryourway.com and have an extra cylinder on hand, but it makes it extremely easy to uh, take care of your snow measurements. It simplifies your life. If it's snowing at the time of your observation and it's snowing well and you don't want to miss anything, you can take your extra cylinder out, swap it with the one outside and bring it in to measure your, your uh gauge catch for that 24 hour period. And you won't have to worry about missing any precipitation. It's also nice to have when you're taking a core for the 24 hour snowfall sweep. You don't have to take your cylinder in, melt it, wait for it to melt, measure it, dry it off, go outside, take the core, bring it in and the whole thing. It saves a lot of time. And some of us have three and four, you know, three and four extra cylinders for snow measurement and swapping out. One of the things you'll find that will really simplify your life a lot in a way is weighing the snow in your rain gauge or weighing the water in your rain gauge even during the summer as a very quick and fairly accurate way to obtain the, the liquid equivalent of what's in that gauge. Um, we will talk, we'll give you a specific example here in a moment. 
you first need to know the weight of your empty cylinder. You need a digital scale. There are some very good kitchen scales that are reasonably priced that you can use. Um, you can check those out with some test weights if you're not sure, but um, usually the scales at good reviews are, are the ones that people have tested out. You write that weight on the bottom with a permanent marker. And you're gonna to need to do this every year probably. Uh, the gauges will slightly change weight and the marker will fade, especially when it's been out in the summer, sun all summer. And then you place the cylinder with the snow or water on the scale and you write down the weight. One thing to remember is to make sure the outside of the cylinder is dry. So if there's snow clinging to the side or ice on the side, make sure you get that off before you weigh the cylinder plus the water inside. You subtract the weight of the cylinder that you just measured from the total, the gross weight, and you divide the result by 201. That 201 is the number as 201 grams per inch of water in the stratus gauge. So if you filled up the inner measuring tube on a stratus gauge to the one inch mark, water inside that would weigh 201 grams. And that result is the amount of water in inches, and you've done it without ever and if it's snow you know without ever having to melt anything so here's a more specific example the cylinder plus water is 566 grams the cylinder itself is 453 uh, and so the weight of the water when you subtract the cylinder from the gross weight is 113 grams to determine how much precipitation that is you divide that 113 by 201 and you get 0 0.56 inch of precipitation and that's what you would enter for your gauge catch and you're done um, i use this during the summer as well when we have heavy rain more than an inch of rain i'll weigh what's in the outer cylinder add it to the, what's in the inner cylinder and i i have my uh, uh total precipitation without having to pour empty and pours this is really useful if you have like two or three inches of rain and you're not doing multiple pours. It's more accurate, you're less you won't be spilling anything. And uh, it does require a little bit of math, but other than that, it really is uh, pretty simple to do. So we've covered our pretty much all we wanna talk about today. I wanna to talk about a little bit about training resources. For those of you folks on our mobile app, if that's been your primary experience up to now, you really should do yourselves a favor and check out our website and see what's available on uh, our website in terms of training and information. There is a ton of stuff on there. We have training anim animations on YouTube that cover all aspects of measuring snow. These are a little dated. They don't include all our new terminology, but the concepts are the same and they're very uh, easy to watch. You notice that most of them are under two, two minutes and they cover a specific topic and, and they're really well done. So I would encourage you to check those out uh, even occasionally as a refresher. And then we have this program and several others on our website under the heading training slide presentations that little icon on the right hand side of our homepage. So please check those out as well. And it's good, you know, <clears throat> to review these before every season. Or, you know, if you're not, if you're in an area that doesn't start getting snow until January, uh, typically, then you review it again before you start getting snow, or just before you get a snowstorm. So it's all there for you to look at. So at this point, that wraps up the formal presentation. And Noah, we can take care of any questions in the time remaining. Yeah, one that I want to bring up, just if you go back one slide that shows the screenshot of the training animations, which are found, there's a link on the right hand side of our homepage. But that one in the lower left corner, um, go back to the training slideshows. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, the one in the lower left corner says all alternative methods for making snow Kokoro snow water content measurements. I want to point that out that this is written by our Canadian counterparts and it's got instructions for using a extended uh, PVC pipe, a, a four inch PVC pipe for those who are uh, in in serious deep snow uh, territory where you're and you're and and you've got the motivation to do such a thing. So uh, check out uh, th that link for alternative methods to, to uh, get the instructions for using a four inch PVC uh, tube. Um, Steve, my one question for you, and you can now forward, forward to your questions slide if you want, but uh, 
what about the case of freezing fog where it can create almost horizontal icicles on your tree branches? Yeah, freezing fog will call what we call rime icing. And that real, and then again, that is that is condensation in in a way. It's basically cloud particles, cloud droplets, uh, freezing on contact. Um, again, if if you can feel or see particles in the air um, falling, and it's from above, I guess you want to say that would be precipitation. But in typical freezing fog, dew and frost are not precipitation. So. Um, uh, they wouldn't be counted as such. Rime icing occurs uh, and it can occur on us otherwise sunny day. I mean, you might have an early morning fog that coats everything, but there were never any really clouds above that were precipitating. It was just because that dampness all froze and there was a good wind that drove that um, those particles through the trees and everything. So freezing fog would not really be a precipitation event. Yep. So again, that if you're not sure what goes on, you know, mention what happened in your comments. Yeah. No, those were great questions that came through. Yeah. I think we've covered everything today, Steve. So, um, wow. yeah, I, I want to thank everyone for joining us today on this Saturday matinee of our winter precipitation measurements presentation. And thanks to all of you. Uh, Kokoraz volunteers, we really appreciate all that you do for us and uh, keep up the great work. So thanks Have again. Have a great weekend. Yeah. Thank you again, Steve. We really appreciate it.